we can easily choose our friends, but choosing our relatives is a different matter, and is sometimes unfortunate, seeing as how some relatives are mad, bad, and dangerous to know, particularly as it pertains to their kin, and especially so when those iffy relations are royals or otherwise powerful figures. The nastiness of such relatives is not limited to ruining Christmas and Thanksgiving, or to engaging in bouts of passive-aggressive snark, when they act up, they can prove quite deadly, as in kill their kin quickly if they're feeling kindly, or torture them to death if they are in a particularly foul mood. So without further ado, let us take a look at top 20 fascinating things about history's deadliest relatives. Number 1. Constantine the Great Killed His Son Constantine the Great had many admirers in his era, particularly Christians grateful to him for taking Christianity out of the catacombs and into the palace. He also gave the Roman Empire a new lease on life, relocated the capital from Rome to the newly built Constantinople, and laid the foundations for an Eastern Roman Empire whose remnants survived into the 15th century. However, his admirers seldom mentioned his shortcomings, such as the mercurial temper that led him to kill his eldest son, Crispus, circa 299 to 326, the kind of dutiful and capable son who would have made any father proud. While still in his teens, Constantine appointed Crispus commander in Gaul, and he delivered, winning victories in 318, 320, and 323, that secured the province and the Germanic frontier. In a civil war against a challenger, Licinius, Crispus commanded Constantine's navy and led it to a decisive victory over a far larger fleet. He also played a key role in a subsequent battle that secured his father's triumph over Licinius. Then in 326, his life came to a sudden end when his stepmother, eager to remove an obstacle to her own son's succession to the throne, falsely accused Crispus of having tried to rape her. An enraged Constantine had Crispus tried and convicted before a local court, then ordered him executed by hanging. Number 2. After killing his son, Constantine killed his wife. Flavia Maxima Fausta 289-326, daughter of Roman Emperor Maximianus, was married to Constantine the Great in 307 to seal an alliance between him and her father. She bore Constantine three sons, but her stepson Crispus, Constantine's eldest from a previous marriage, stood between her sons and the throne. In 326, Crispus was at the height of his power and the odds on favor to succeed Constantine, having played a key role in defeating a recent challenger to his father. By contrast, Fausta's sons were in no position to don the purple, the eldest of them being only ten years old at the time. In order for any of Fausta's sons to succeed Constantine, something would have to happen to Crispus. So Fausta saw to it that something did. Foster reportedly tried to seduce Crispus, but he balked, and hurriedly left the palace. Undaunted, she told Constantine that Crispus did not respect his father, since he was in love with and had tried to rape his father's wife. Constantine believed her, and had his eldest son executed. A few months later, however, Constantine discovered how his wife had manipulated him into killing Crispus, and had her executed by tossing her into boiling water. He then issued a Domnatio Memoriae condemnation of memory, to erase her from official accounts, a form of dishonor issued against traitors and those who brought discredit to the Roman state. Number 3. Antonia Minor Starved Her Daughter to Death Antonia Minor, 36 BC to 37 AD, was the younger daughter of Mark Antony and Emperor Augustus' sister Octavia Minor. In 16 BC, she married the future Emperor Tiberius' brother, Drusus, and bore him several children, of whom three survived, Germanicus, father of Emperor Caligula and maternal grandfather of Emperor Nero, the future Emperor Claudius, and a daughter, Lavilla. Her husband died in 9 BC from injuries sustained after falling from a horse, and although her uncle Augustus and the rest of the family pressured Antonia to remarry, she never did. She developed a reputation as an old-fashioned and straight-list prude, who embodied the traditional virtues of Roman matrons. 
so it was unfortunate for all involved that her daughter Lavilla became a chief participant in a scandal that rocked Rome to its foundations. Lavilla was married to another Drusus, her cousin and the son of the emperor Tiberius, when she began an affair with Sianus, commander of the Praetorian Guard. He and Lavilla poisoned Drusus, then plotted to kill Tiberius so Sianus could replace him on the throne. Antonio Minor, however, tipped off Tiberius that Sianus planned to kill him, so the emperor beat him to the punch and had him executed. In the subsequent investigation, evidence emerged that Lavilla had been involved in the plot, and that she had poisoned her husband Drusus. Tiberius spared Lavilla's life, and instead handed her over to her mother. To save face, Antonia Minor locked her daughter in her room and starved her to death. Number 4. Ottoman sultans routinely murdered their siblings. Throughout history, many kingdoms collapsed into chaos, and many ruling dynasties vanished into the dustbin of history because of infighting by royal siblings competing for the throne. The early Ottoman Turks tackled that problem head on, with one of the most ruthless solutions possible. As soon as a new Ottoman sultan ascended the throne, he immediately executed all his brothers. The prospects of deadly rivalries and civil wars were thus eliminated by the simple expedient of eliminating all potential male claimants to the throne. The early Ottomans had no clear-cut rules of succession. When princes reached puberty, their father the sultan usually sent them out to govern a province, where they often built up a power base of ambitious followers, eager to prosper by urging their royal governor to make a bid for the throne upon his father's death. Thus the death of a sultan was often followed by a bout of civil war between his sons, and the early reign of a new sultan was often marked by the revolts of envious brothers seeking to replace him on the throne. Eventually, Sultan Mehmed II the conqueror enacted a law of governance, stating in relevant part, any of my sons who ascends the throne, it is acceptable for him to kill his brothers for the common benefit of the people. The majority of the ulama, Muslim scholars, approve this, let action be taken accordingly. Number 5. The Ottoman Sultan's Humane Alternative to Murdering Their Brothers Ottoman Sultan Mehmed II's successors usually heeded his advice to maintain the stability of the realm by preemptively executing their brothers on ascending the throne. It was a cruel expedient, but it worked. For the next two centuries, the Ottoman Empire was remarkably stable and free of infighting and civil wars when compared to its contemporaries. However, although the system worked, the consciences of many throughout the realm were bothered by the murder of innocent royal siblings at the start of each reign. Those misgivings reached a peak when Sultan Mehmed III, reigned 1595-1603, inaugurated his reign by ordering his 19 brothers, some of them mere infants, strangled to death. It was said that the empire wept as a long line of child-sized coffins exited the palace in a grand procession the next day. Eventually, a reaction set in against that tradition of fratricide, and a new tradition was developed to take its place, Instead of new sultans outright murdering their siblings upon ascending the throne, they simply locked them up. Thus was born the system of the Ottoman calves, or cage, whereby sultans set up a secluded part of their royal harem as a detention center for their brothers. Their potential rivals to the throne were kept under house arrest, under surveillance by palace guards and isolated from the outside world to prevent intrigues and plots. As seen below, life in the calves could be rough, but for those living in it, the very fact that they were still living at all meant that it, usually, beat the alternative. Number 6. Sultan Murad IV got a kick out of playing deadly mind games with his captive brothers. Unlike many of his predecessors, Sultan Murad IV, reigned 1623-1640, did not murder his siblings upon ascending the throne, and settled instead for locking them up inside his harem and in the calf's, or cage. While the calf system was set up as a more merciful alternative to how prior generations of Ottoman sultans had dealt with their brothers, it might not have been much of a mercy in Murad's case. All things considered, many of his imprisoned male siblings might have wished that Murad had simply gotten it over and done with, 
and gone ahead and executed them at the start of his reign. Murad IV seems to have combined paranoia with sadism. He constantly suspected his captive brothers of plotting against him, and never tired of trying to entrap them into saying any careless old thing that could remotely be interpreted as validating his suspicions. Murad sent seemingly sympathetic guards or servants to try and draw out this or that imprisoned brother into uttering anything that could be seen as treasonous. Any slip of the tongue could result in an imprisoned sibling getting accused of plotting against the sultan, who was just itching for an excuse to execute his brothers. That eagerness to shed blood was unsurprising, considering that Murad's entertainment included shooting arrows to kill any unwary fishermen whose boats drifted to close to his seaside palace. Number 7. Murad IV's mind games left his last surviving brother a gibbering idiot. Ibrahim I, aka the Mad Sultan, reigned 1640-1648, was imprisoned in the Kafs at age 8 when his brother Murad IV ascended the throne in 1623. While in the Kafs, Murad executed his other brothers, one by one, until only Ibrahim was left, quaking in fear that he might be next. He remained in confinement until he was suddenly dragged out of the caste to ascend the throne following Murad's death in 1640. Ibrahim refused at first, and rushed back into the caste to barricade himself inside, suspecting it was a cruel trick to entrap him into saying or doing something that his fratricidal brother would take as treasonous. Only after Murad's dead body was brought to the door for him to examine, and the intercession of his mother who had to coax him out like a kitten with food, was Ibrahim convinced to accept the throne. By then, however, the years of isolation in the caste, and the constant terror that he might get executed at any moment, had unhinged Ibrahim and left him unfit to rule. Already known to be mentally unstable, his condition was worsened by depression over the death of his brother the Sultan, whom he apparently loved in a Stockholm Syndrome type of way, an early worrying sign was the new sultan's habit of feeding the fish in the palace pool with coins instead of food. As it became clear that Ibrahim was crazy, his mother ruled in his stead. She also encouraged him to spend as much time as possible in the harem with his nearly 300 concubines, both to keep him out of her hair and out of trouble, and to father male heirs since, by then, Ibrahim was the last surviving male of the Ottoman dynasty. Number 8 Murad IV turned his successor into the Mad Sultan. Murad IV's sadistic mind games while his brother Ibrahim was locked up in the calves drove his sibling insane. After getting coaxed into accepting the throne, Ibrahim I, the Mad Sultan, took to having the run of the harem with a relish, swiftly fathering three future sultans, plus a number of daughters. Until he woke up one morning and in a fit of madness, ordered the roughly 300 women of his harem tied up in weighted sacks, and drowned in the Bosporus. Ibrahim also engaged in other depravities, such as kidnapping the daughter of the Grand Mufti, the empire's highest religious authority, and ravishing her for days, before returning her to her father. Eventually Ibrahim exiled his mother who had been ruling in his stead, and assumed personal control of the government. The results were catastrophic, after ordering the execution of his most capable ministers, he spent profligately until he emptied the treasury, even as he got himself into a series of wars and managed them poorly. By 1647, between heavy taxes to pay for the bungled wars and for Ibrahim's extravagant lifestyle, and with a Venetian blockade of the Dardanelles that brought the Ottoman capital to the brink of starvation, discontent boiled over. A revolt erupted in 1648, urged on by religious scholars, and the army joined in. An angry mob seized Ibrahim's grand vizier and tore him to pieces, and the sultan was deposed in favor of his six-year-old son. A fatwa was then issued for Ibrahim's execution, which was carried out by strangulation on August 18, 1648. Number 9. Messalina was done in by her husband, Claudius. Valeria Messalina, circa 20 to 48 AD, was Emperor Augustus' great grandniece, and a cousin of the emperors Caligula and Nero. Along with Augustus' daughter Julia, who was banished by her father for excessive promiscuity, 
Messalina is probably one of the most notoriously promiscuous women in Roman history. Her path to becoming empress began in 37 AD, when the future emperor Claudius, 30 years her senior, picked her to be his third wife. As with many unions between young women and much older men, the marriage did not work out. Aside from the age difference, Claudius was an exceptionally physically unappealing man, he limped, stuttered, and drooled. Those shortcomings led the imperial family to sideline him as an embarrassment and borderline idiot. He was no idiot, indeed, he was a scholar and the Roman equivalent of a nerd. Still, he was not exactly the type to set pretty girls' hearts aflutter. Claudius doted on his younger wife, who used her sexual allure to wrap him around her finger. When he became emperor in 41, Messalina got Claudius to execute or exile anybody who displeased her, and a good many people displeased her. She seems to have despised Claudius, and cheated on him non-stop. Brazenly so, in one instance, Salacious contemporary accounts had her winning a competition with a prostitute to see who could sleep with the most people in one night. Her most famous affair was with a senator, Gaius Silius, with whom she plotted to murder Claudius, so Silius could take his place on the throne. Considering the recklessness with which she went about it, she might have been a bit unhinged. While Claudius was out of Rome, Messalina married Silius, and celebrated it with a huge banquet. Claudius rushed back to Rome, confirmed the affair, and had her executed. Number 10. Claudius was done in by his next wife, Agrippina. Claudius was very unfortunate when it came to marriage. He divorced his first wife, Plasha Ergilinilla, for adultery after she became pregnant by one of Claudius' freedmen, and because she was suspected of murdering her sister-in-law. His second marriage, Huelia Pitina, also ended in divorce, because she mentally and physically abused him. His first two wives cheated on or abused Claudius, but at least they did not try to murder him. His third wife did. Valeria Messalina seemingly slept with half of Rome, publicly wed another man while still married to Claudius, and plotted with her lover and bigamous husband to murder her imperial hubby and usurp his throne. That marriage ended in Messalina's execution. An incorrigible optimist, Claudius married for a fourth time, this time wedding his niece Agrippina the Younger, 15 to 59 AD, 33 years his junior. That marriage ended with her poisoning him to death. Agrippina was the granddaughter of Roman Emperor Augustus and the younger sister of Emperor Caligula. At age 13, she married a cousin, Gnaeus Domitius Ahenobarbus, and bore him a son, future Emperor Nero. Ahenobarbus died in 41 AD, and when Claudius executed Messalina in 48 AD, he chose Agrippina as his fourth wife. She convinced Claudius to adopt her son Nero, and make him his heir and recognized successor in lieu of his biological son with Messalina, Britannicus. By 54 AD, Claudius seemed to reap in of marrying Agrippina, and began favoring Britannicus and preparing him for the throne. So Agrippina poisoned Claudius at a banquet with a plate of deadly mushrooms. For the remainder of her life, she jokingly referred to mushrooms as the food of the gods, because Roman emperors were deified as gods after their deaths, and by killing Claudius, mushrooms had made him a god. Number 11. Agrippina was done in by her son Nero. Having secured the throne for her underage son Nero by poisoning her husband, the emperor Claudius, Agrippina the Younger set out to rule by dominating Nero. Salacious contemporary accounts report that she controlled her teenage son with incest. As one Roman era writer described it, whenever he rode in a litter with his mother, he had incestuous relations with her, which were betrayed by stains in his clothing. That kind of upbringing sheds might shed some light on how Nero ended up so unhinged and depraved. When Nero grew older he tried to assert his independence, but his mother refused to give up her power, and kept meddling in government. So he decided to murder her. Nero resorted to elaborate plans to do in his mother, because he wanted to make her death look accidental. His schemes were straight out of Looney Tunes. 
he had a roof constructed that was designed to fall down on top of his mother, but she survived the crash. He then gifted Agrippina with a pleasure barge that was specially designed to collapse. The barge did collapse as designed in the middle of a lake while Nero watched from his villa, but to his astonishment, his mother made it out of the wreckage, swam like an otter, and made it to shore. Horrified, and dreading the awkwardness of the inevitable confrontation, Nero finally threw in the towel on subtlety, and abandoning all pretense, he ordered some sailors go and club his mother to death with oars. Number 12. I would rather be Herod's pig than his son. Quipping about how Herod the Great of Judea, 74 BC, circa 180, treated his offspring, the Roman Emperor Augustus remarked, I would rather be Herod's pig than his son. The Roman client king built some massive projects during his reign, such as the Second Temple in Jerusalem, and the Fortress of Masada. However, he is best known from the Christian Gospels as the king who ordered the massacre of the innocents when Jesus was born. His reign had started off well, but as it progressed, Herod started getting paranoid about plots against him, some real, others imaginary. Those around Herod manipulated his fears, causing him to often lash out violently. The victims of his wrath included members of his own family. Herod was born to an Edomite father, from a people who had been forcibly converted to Judaism only a generation or two before Herod's birth. However, he was raised as a nominal Jew, and he married into the ruling Jewish Hasmonean dynasty, tying the knot with Princess Mariamne, one of the last Hasmonean heirs. He then killed her relatives, removing contenders for the throne of Judea, and got the Romans to make him king of the Jews. Understandably, that gave Mariamne plenty of cause to resent her husband. As seen below, that did not turn out well for Mariamne. It also did not turn out well for two of her sons with Herod, Alexander, and Aristobulus, who resented how their father had treated their mother. Number 13. Herod Executes His Son Mariamne was a stunning beauty, and Herod was crazy about her, but not in a good way. On the one hand, he was passionately in love with her. On the other hand, he was also crazy jealous. While Herod loved Mariamne, she did not return the feeling. It was probably understandable, considering that Herod had killed her brother and uncle, and that Herod's father had killed Mariamne's father, then embalmed him in a tub of honey. Nonetheless, Herod had five children with her, two girls and three boys. In 29 BC Herod suspected Mariamne of plotting against him, so he had her executed. Understandably, her children resented that, and grew up with a fractious relationship with their father. Two in particular, Alexander and Aristobulus, did a poor job of hiding their resentment of Herod, which led him to suspect them of plotting against him to avenge the execution of their mother. So Herod imprisoned Alexander in 10 BC, and three years later, at him and his brother Aristobulus charged with treason. Both were convicted, and Herod ordered his sons strangled to death in 7 BC, giving rise to Augustus' quip that it was better to be Herod's pig than his son. Number 14. Being Herod's son was still better than being Herod's wife. Herod was obsessed with his wife Mariamne, who was said to be drop-dead gorgeous. However, Considering how many of her relatives Herod had murdered, Mariamne could not bring herself to love him back. Eventually, after having five children with Herod, Mariamne stopped having sex with him, which fueled his suspicions that she was cheating on him. Herod's mother and sister fanned those suspicions, and added to them accusations that Mariamne planned to poison him, as well. Eventually, Herod ordered Mariamne executed in 29 BC. That was bad enough, but things soon went from bad to grotesque. Despite having ordered Mariamne's execution, Herod exhibited intense grief for her death. He often broke into uncontrollable fits of sobbing, went into a deep depression, and was unable to let her go. That is, Herod was literally unable to let her go. According to the Talmud, Herod had his dead wife's body preserved, and he kept making love to the corpse for seven whole years. 
the Talmud described it as Herod fulfilling his animalistic desires with the cadaver. It wasn't just icky, but also sticky. Herod had supposedly preserved Mariamne's corpse with honey. Number 15. The Empress Who Smothered Her Daughter and Deposed Her Son Wuho, 624-705, who combined beauty with brains and utter ruthlessness, was taken into Chinese Emperor Taizong's harem, as a concubine at age 14. However, the aging emperor was not into intelligent women, so he did not favor Wu Ho. Being an intelligent woman, she looked ahead, and had an affair with the emperor's son and eventual successor. The son was not intimidated by smart women, and when he became emperor Jezong after his father's death, he made Wu Ho his favorite concubine. He eventually elevated her to his second wife, a huge jump in the imperial harem's rankings. Not content to remain second fiddle, however, Wu Ho reportedly strangled her own infant daughter and framed the emperor's first wife for the death. The intrigue worked, and Wu Ho became the emperor's official consort. Wu Ho then set out to enhance her power and methodically went about eliminating her opponents. When Emperor Jezong died in 683, she became Empress Dowager and Regent, running the empire in the name of her son, Emperor Thongzong. When Thongzong ascended the throne in his own right in 684, he tried to buck his mother and get out from under her thumb. He lasted only six weeks on the throne, before Wu Ho had him deposed, exiled, and replaced with her youngest son, whom she made Emperor Ruizong. She maintained all power in her own hands, and six years later, she tired of bothering with any pretense about who actually ran China, and made Ruizong relinquish the throne. Wu Ho then officially proclaimed herself Empress Regnant, and ruled in that capacity until she was overthrown in 705. Number 16. Geta was murdered by his brother while cowering in the arms of their mother. Brothers Geta and Caracalla jointly inherited Rome's imperial throne when their father, the Emperor Septimius Severus, died in Britain in 211. Severus had been a generally capable emperor, who had unified the empire and restored order after a period of chaos following the death of Emperor Commodus, the evil ruler from Gladiator. However, handing the empire over to his sons to rule jointly was not one of Severus' better ideas. Even during their father's life, the siblings had been bitter rivals, and things only got worse when they became co-emperors. During the journey back to Rome with their father's ashes, Caracalla and Geta quarreled non-stop, and their already tense relationship steadily grew more toxic. At some point they decided to avert open conflict by splitting the empire between themselves, with Caracalla ruling the western half of the Roman Empire, and Geta ruling the eastern half. However, their mother talked them out of it, and arranged a reconciliation meeting between them for December 26, 211. When looking back at how the get-together went down, she probably kicked herself for not having simply let her sons go their separate ways. Caracalla ordered his henchmen to murder his sibling at the meeting. A grievously wounded Gitta fell into his mother's bosom, and she frantically begged Caracalla to call off his men. He ignored her pleas and personally finished off his brother with a knife while Geta cowered in their mother's arms. Number 17. The Emperor Who Went Out of His Way to Show His Sister Who Was Boss Peter the Great ascended the throne as a child, and throughout much of his youth, his elder sister Sofia Alexeyevna ran Russia as regent. She got used to power, but as Peter he grew up, he began asserting his independence. When Sophia resisted surrendering her power, he had her locked up in a monastery. In 1698, while Peter was still getting a feel for his power, the Streltsy regiments, a sort of medieval Russian Praetorian guard, rebelled and sought to overthrow Peter and replace him on the throne with Sophia. A lover of Sophia led the Streltsy rebellion while Peter was out of the country, forcing him to rush back to Russia. By the time he got back home, the rebellion had already collapsed. Upon reaching Moscow, he brutally suppressed and broke the Streltsy, who were tortured and executed by the thousands. Peter played an active part in the executions, 
personally chopping off the heads of rebels with an axe in public, in what is now Moscow's Red Square. He spared Sophia's life, but strung up the bodies of executed Streltsy outside her monastery, and left the corpse of her lover dangling from a rope directly outside her window. Number 18. Peter the Great forced his wife to keep the pickled head of her lover in her bedroom. Peter the Great seems to have had a thing for intimidating the women in his family. Late in his reign rumors made the rounds that Peter's wife, the Empress Catherine, was having an affair with her private secretary, Willem Mons. Gossip had it that the duo were lovers, and that Willem Mons' sister, Matriona Bach, had played matchmaker. One of the juicier tales held that Peter had found his wife with Mons one moonlit night in a compromising position in her garden. Whether or not Peter had actually witnessed his wife getting it on with her secretary, he did get word of the lurid stories about his wife. So the emperor had Mons arrested and hauled off in chains, on charges of embezzlement and abuse of trust. His sister Matriona, the supposed matchmaker, was also arrested publicly flogged, and exiled to Siberia. On November 28, 1724, eight days after his arrest, Willem Mons was publicly beheaded in St. Petersburg. While that was going on, Catherine put on a public display of indifference towards her secretary's fate, which probably saved her own head. However, Peter put on a final demonstration of his power, in a bid to test whether his wife's indifference was genuine. He had Mons head preserved in alcohol and put in a glass jar, which he then placed in Catherine's bedroom. Number 19. Attila assumed sole rule of the Huns by murdering his brother. Attila was born in 406 into the Hun royal family, and inherited the crown jointly with his brother Bleda in 434. The brothers were challenged early on, but crushed the opposition. When their surviving enemies fled to the Roman Empire, the brothers invaded and forced the Romans to surrender the fugitives, and agree to an annual tribute of 230 kilograms of gold. Attila and Bleda then turned their attention to the Persian Empire, which they invaded and plundered for years before they were beaten back. They then returned their attention to Europe and the Roman Empire. Attila and Bleda crossed the Danube in 440, plundered the Balkans, and destroyed two Roman armies. The Roman Emperor admitted defeat, and the brothers extorted from him a new treaty that paid them 2,000 kilograms of gold up front plus an annual tribute of 700 kilograms of gold. Soon thereafter, Attila tired of the joint kingship, and decided to consolidate power and rule alone. So in 445, during a wild boar hunt, Attila had his brother seized, shot him to death with arrows, then claimed that it had been a hunting accident. Number 20. The First Ptolemy to Murder His Mother the Ptolemaic dynasty of Egypt might have been history's most depraved and dysfunctional ruling family, but for all that they managed to hang on to power for nearly three centuries. The dynasty's rot and track record of depravity arguably began when Ptolemy II married his own sister. The consequences of introducing that tradition of incest into the dynasty were long-lasting, ultimately producing a long line of unfit rulers, and transforming the Ptolemies into objects of ridicule among Hellenistic and Roman contemporaries. Incest was arguably eclipsed, however, by Ptolemy IV, reigned 221 204 BC, who added intrafamilial murder to the Ptolemaic dynasty's repertoire by murdering his mother, Berenice II. Ptolemy IV had ascended the throne in 221 BC as co ruler with his mother. Berenice II was a formidable woman who had once stemmed a battlefield route by mounting a horse, rallying her side's surviving troops, and leading them in a counter-charge that seized victory from the jaws of defeat. Feeling intimidated and wanting to rule alone, Ptolemy IV inaugurated his reign by murdering his mother. Notwithstanding that act of ruthlessness, he was a weak-willed ruler who was dominated by his mistress and court favorites, and an airhead who devoted himself to religious rituals. While Ptolemy IV devoted himself to fluff, Egypt was torn apart by serious rebellions that took decades to suppress. Since incest by then was a Ptolemaic tradition, Ptolemy IV also married his own sister, Arsinoe III, 
who gave birth to his heir, Ptolemy V, 